But I just want to go ahead and cut to the chase. You know, I could preach a long sermon, but I, I want to I want to give you the point of my sermon right now. The point of all that's going on in our lives after we get the baptism of the Holy Ghost is God wants to purify you of all that's wrong in your heart and in your mind. He wants to heal you of all the bad memories that you've got because you grew up in a dysfunctional family and you didn't get treated like you should have been and you have a little hate and bitterness in your heart. God wants to get that out of you. And how does he do it? By washing our eyes with tears. <laughs> By melting us down. It's kind of painful. That's why we sing, I've had some bad days. But, but the good part about it is, you feel so much better when you lose some of that stuff. Life is so much better you see if you grow up in a dysfunctional home and you're insecure and you don't know who you really are and you you kind of don't identify and you don't feel good about yourself you're trying to you're trying to you're comparing yourself with everybody else you're saying they're smarter than i am i wish i could be smart they got more money than i've got i wish i had more money wouldn't you like to be free from that? Wouldn't you like to be happy about who you are? Wouldn't you like to be able to see people that's got it worse than you've got and say, oh, I wish I could help that person? Because money and talent and power is not where joy is at. And you're never going to have that deep, intimate relationship with Jesus until you let him purify your heart. It's painful, but it's worth it. So, Sister Con, you got another song? Well, I guess it's up to me now. Oh, I was just praying around here. I got here pretty early this morning. I love to come pray in the house of God. And I thought about all the messages that I could preach, but I want what God wants. And he pointed something out to me that probably ain't going to impress some of you folks. That, But maybe I'm not here to impress anyone. I'm here to just deliver my soul. And it says over there in the book of Mark, the fifth chapter, the twelfth verse, Mark 5, 12 through 20. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. Now Jesus answered the prayer of demons. You figure this out. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave. And the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently. Notice that word violently. Down a steep place into the sea, and there were about 2,000. Now, you folks know that this is the context of this was when Jesus was in the boat, and he landed at a place called Decapolis, the, the country of the Gadarenes, and there met him a what's referred to many times as the maniac of Gadara. He identified himself as legion, and some folks call him legion, but he was delivered of that legion of demons. So he really, that's not his name. That was the name of the demons that was in him. You folks believe in deliverance from the devil around here? Well, I'm not an expert in casting out devils, but I've done it a time or two. And if you've got a devil in you, we can take care of him right now. Me and Jesus and Brother Crow can take care of whatever evil spirit has got a hold of you, and you'll be so much better off. 
These demons asked Jesus when he rebuked them to let them go into the swine. 2,000. They were choked in the sea. And they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city. That's not a good thing right there. And in the country. And they went out to see what was that was done. And they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devils and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. What a statement. <laughs> and they were afraid. Think about that. They were happier with a man howling all night long and scaring the kids and cutting himself and being crazy. They, were, they, were, they got used to that. And they weren't used to a miracle. But the miracle worker was there. And uh, let's see. And they began to pray Jesus or him to depart out of their coasts. Wow. You ever told someone to leave your property? You ever? That's kind of rude, isn't it? I don't even tell people to leave the church. I pray that God will put them out when they need to go. And he does. But these people said, depart out of our coasts. And when he was come to the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Oh, I would have too. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on the two things. But the Lord has done and had compassion on you. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis. That is a Greek word that means ten towns. Ten towns. It was a whole district. The one city, the Gadarenes, was a city. And I believe there was a diabolical plot by these demons that came out of the man that wanted to ruin the testimony of Jesus in that region. And it, you could almost say, did Jesus make a mistake? Lord, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you, Father, for your beautiful people. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and love and mercy and the beautiful songs that have been sung. But, Lord, your word is so important right now, and I pray that I would humbly be able to deliver this message to your beautiful people. And we thank you for doing it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you may be seated. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I've kind of already told you a little bit about where we're going with this little story here. It's, uh, it's found in all the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And uh, it was quite an amazing story because it stuck in the minds of the apostles. Now, I spoke to you all ago about my point today is God is in the process of purifying you and me. He uses different tactics and different things. Trials come our way. Now, if you want to go to heaven, you're going to have to go through a few life-changing experiences. Now, if you just want to have a life with no conflict and no battle with the devil and, and get rich, dumb, and happy, you can do that, and you'll go to hell. Because we used to sing a song, sin can never enter there. And there's no unclean thing that go in there. And we human beings are kind of... <laughs> Uh, kind of in a minefield. We're kind of trying to go through a very difficult world because there's demonic powers that we can't even see. There is a spirit world that can depress us, can talk to us, can lie to us, can deceive us. And it's 
impossible for us to be saved without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You cannot be saved by just shaking the preacher's hand, signing the card, joining the church. Forget all that. But then there's some people that speak in tongues that don't let the Holy Ghost change them, and they're not going to go to heaven either. It's not obeying Acts 2.38. It's obeying the Spirit when you get it. Letting the Lord talk to you. Saying yes to God. He'll put you on a regimen of prayer every morning. If you're not praying every morning, you done messed up somewhere along the way. Well, you can pray late at night. I'm, I'm just telling you about the way I am. You have to pray and renew your mind and lay your burdens down because Jesus said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. you got to have nourishment for your spirit. you got to have the word of God. He said that his mercies were new every morning. He said that there would be manna. Give us that hidden manna. You got to get up early sometime to get that manna because it melts when the sun comes up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because early in the morning, you know, the, the Walmart's not even open. And, and hardware store's not even open. So your mind is a whole lot easier to be focused on Jesus because you're not thinking about shopping and all that other stuff. But nonetheless, I just want to point out a few things about what Jesus did and allowed to happen to his 12 apostles. Now, get the picture. Here Jesus is. They land the ship on this shore, and this maniac comes screaming and yelling and Jesus commands the, the devil to come out, and he falls at Jesus' feet and starts worshiping Jesus. And, and, and then Jesus said, what is your name? <laughs> I'm telling you, folks, casting out a devil is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen in my life. We were in Concord, California, preaching a revival, and, and they come and got me, and they said, Brother Con, you better come back here and pray for this lady. And she was laid out white as a ghost on the floor, and the demon had a hold of her. And I said, get her up and get her into the to prayer room, because the devil loves nothing more than to get your attention on him. We got this little girl back in the prayer room and a few good saints gathered. You could just feel the demon powers of hell. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you couldn't hardly walk around. You couldn't hardly worship. You couldn't hardly pray. It was like we had weights on our hands. Don't you ever underestimate the devil. And I didn't have a dad for a pastor. My, my, my father-in-law wasn't a pastor. I didn't know anything but just pray and fast and be led by the Spirit. And I wasn't but about 20. I didn't know much at all. But I'd read my Bible. And there's a name above every other name. And that girl, I said, to that Spirit, I said, what is your name? And she spoke out, and she said, my name is Legion. Wow. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Legion, I command you to come out. And I will never forget what happened. It was like a bolt of lightning hit that room. And there was such a breaking of the spirit that just about everybody in the room just started dancing in the spirit. It went from demon to angel just like that. It went from the power of darkness to the power of light. And what was so good, the little girl fell on her knees talking in other tongues as the Spirit gave her the utterance. 
Oh, let me tell you, folks, we got some power around here. And don't you let the devil intimidate you about anything because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You can cast the devil out of your house. You can cast the devil out of your car. You can cast the devil out of your kids. Yeah, the devil will get on your kids. They go to school and they pick up all kinds of spirits. And a good whooping ain't probably going to deliver them from it. But if you'll get them down and pray. Oh, I remember our teenager went to school and she had an attitude about her mother. And I announced about sometime in the afternoon, I said, we're going to have a prayer. We're going to have family prayer at 9 o'clock. Just be ready. You know, I'm the spiritual leader. Oh, yeah, we started praying. And something happened. It's amazing what can happen when you learn to pray. I love to pray. It's the most beautiful time of my day. I don't even have to set an alarm clock. He just wakes me up. Or maybe I wake myself up because I want to be in his presence. I want to feel that blood cleansing me. I want to be holy and right and pure. I want to have that close, intimate really. Anyway, back to what we were talking about. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> well, as you know, the devil is not a dummy. Uh, he may have got a little brain damage when he got cast out of heaven. I don't know. But there really was quite an amazing little plan, the devil. Why would the devil want to go into those swine? Well, they didn't go into the swine just because they enjoy being in flesh. They made the swine stampede down the bank and drowned in the lake so that those farmers, the pig farmers that were there, was losing money. And so naturally they got upset. And naturally they went to town and they said, folks, you can't believe what happened. There's a, there's a man out there that's doing all kind of bad stuff. He's actually killed all of our swine. They went into the, to the lake and we are going to have an ecological disaster because the water is going to be polluted by this guy. And you people that like to have ham hock in your beans, there ain't gonna be, there's going to be a shortage of ham hock to put in the beans. Oh, think about it. And they got them all worked up. Got them all mad. I can't believe this is happening. This was a demonic plan. The devil's not a dummy. He's wiser than Daniel. He's smart. He knows how to trick you. He knows how to deceive you. He knows how to drag you to hell. He knows how to put bitterness in your heart against somebody. He knows how to talk to you about everything that goes wrong in the church. He can point out everything that's wrong. He can show you every hypocrite in the church. And tell you, ah, oh, you need to run off somewhere else. You need to go find a perfect church, a perfect pastor, and a perfect group of people, and you'll be like a vagabond trying to find that. And you'll never find it. You need to pray and get, get your eyes open to all the good people that's here. You need to get your eyes open to see all the good things that's going on in Souls Harbor Pentecostal Church. Anyway. You know the story. <clears throat> now, here, here's Peter, James, and John, and Judas, and Matthew, and Bartholomew, and all these guys, and they saw it all. Don't you think they kind of looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, you kind of messed up. You shouldn't have let them devils go into those pigs. If you hadn't have done that, we could be evangelizing all over the Gadarenes. Jesus, just think about all of the people that would be worshiping you and, and you could be healing people. You know, Jesus. But they all stayed with him. 
that was a test for the disciples. Jesus knew what the devil was going to do. He didn't make a mistake. There's going to be times when you think your pastor made a mistake, but it might have been you that was on trial. Oh, I, I caught myself on trial the other day. Let me tell you about it. Yeah, I'm the big pastor at the Pentecost Apostolic Church in Topeka, Kansas. And I got this assistant pastor, and I got this pastor, my son-in-law. And, you know, I love the landscape. I love, if you come to see my church, you're going to see more landscape than you want to see probably. Because it's, and I planted some hostas. Y'all know what hostas are? No, y'all don't know. All y'all got is cactus and, and rattlesnakes around here, I guess. I'm just kidding. It's a beautiful, you got a beautiful state. I love the flora and fauna of Arizona. The only problem is you guys just don't get enough snow around here. Anyway, I planted during the pandemic, and when we were shut down, I had to have something to do, so I went and planted some hostas right there, a little flower bed on this side of the sidewalk and on that side of the sidewalk. And, you know, it takes a while for those hostas to grow. And about the second, third year that they were growing, I remembered a sermon that I heard by Lee J. Muncy many years ago, and he said, you can take, he read that scripture where it says, consider the lilies. And he said, you can put a board over the top of where the lilies come up, and it won't stop them. It won't hold them back. They'll just grow sideways and come up. That's the way children of God are supposed to be. You have a problem. You have a, a situation. You just keep on growing. It don't stop you. Some folks hit a little obstacle, and they say, oh, I don't think I can make it now. And so I thought, I'll get me some of those beautiful river rocks, and I'll just pile them up right there on top of my hostess. <clears throat> And there's little places, you know, between the rocks, and the, the hostess will find a, find a place to grow. And I'll be able to get up in the pulpit, and I'll say, folks, that was a sermon. That was an illustrated sermon. Every time you walk out the door, you're going to be able to see what God wants to do in your life. Uh, but somebody moved my rocks. And I thought, I'm the, I'm the man of God around. I've been here 45 years. We wouldn't even have this building if I hadn't prayed and waited on God and God gave it to us. I planted them trees out there lying in the driveway. I put that fence up out there. I put those pillars up. Well, my son-in-law had moved my rocks. And so I put them back. Didn't say a lot. You know, it's good to just, when you get angry, just shut up. Because you might be the one on trial. You think they're guilty? It may be God is showing you how selfish you are. Would you believe somebody moved my rocks again? And boy, by then, I was like a volcano. I said, you know, it's time that these people started respecting me a little bit around here. I might just get like Jesus and get me a whip and give everybody a... And I just held it in. I'm glad I did. I held it in. Brother Joe, I held it in. And I just said, it's best to keep your mouth shut when you're angry. I cooled off. We was all sitting around in the living room. My wife and daughter went in the other room as we was having a little family time. I looked at my son-in-law and said, <clears throat> did, you, did you move my rock? I said, real nice. Really? I did. I'm not kidding. I said it in a very sweet, nice way. Did you move my rocks again? He said, no, I didn't. Well, who did? I said, dear, did you move my rocks? She said, no, I didn't. I said, to my daughter, did you move my rocks? No. I come to realize, yeah, not a big deal. Not a big deal. I found out it don't matter who you are or how long you've lived for God. 
You need to pray every morning, Lord, whatever test I'm going to go through today, I want to pass that test. I don't want to be angry and commit sin. I don't want to hurt somebody. It's not worth it. Let it go. Get a humble spirit about you because you're not that important after all. Anyway. The disciples could have looked at Jesus, and they probably may have. I don't know. Maybe there was a little doubt. Maybe this was the beginning of something in the heart of Judas Iscariot, that kind of, uh, you know, had a question. We don't know. We do know that when Jesus had a big church split, you know, he must have did something wrong, huh? Y'all, y'all, do y'all know Jesus had a church split? Many of his disciples no longer followed him. Sixth chapter of the book of John, they were gone. He fed the multitude. They didn't want, they didn't want uh, a savior like he was. They wanted a king to give them free food every day. There's people like that, and I mean, the crowd began to dwindle. Things began to fall apart. And Jesus looked at his 12 disciples and said, Fellas, are you going to leave me too? And that brings me to an important point. Can, can I make a real important point right now? Are y'all ready for a real? I, I think it's important. Maybe it's not. Every church has a core. But then there are people that are not the foundation people. I mean, those foundation people are bonded to the pastor. They believe in the man of God. But then there's other people that don't really, they haven't got their mind made up. That's called the crowd. There's the core, the partially committed the crowd, the community, and Jesus w- was able to say, these 12 are my foundation. The foundation people may not be a big number, but I thank God for 40 years, 45 years, I've had church splits. I've had church shakeups. I have had people, amen, that falsely accused me, did everything in the book. But there's people that say, I still believe in my pastor. And when there's people leaving, I, 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 you know, I, I don't like to see people leave, but it's better to leave than to sit around and criticize. It's better to just go to the man of God and say, Brother Crow, I love you, and we're always going to be friends. And I don't want you to take it personal, but I'm just going to go somewhere else. But, you know, when I see you at Walmart, I'm going to, I'm going to say hello. I'm going to be friendly. I'm not going to shun you. I'm not going to criticize the church. You've done me a lot of good. Why can't people do that way? It's because the devil wants them to destroy the church. The devil wants to destroy Souls Harbor. The devil wants to destroy this place where you can come and get cleansing and purification and hear the Word of God. You're going to have to get it in your mind. If you go to heaven, you may have to go through a few things. And you may have to make up your mind what you believe and who you believe in. And it would be nice if there was an angel here that was your pastor that never made a mistake but he wouldn't be able to put up with you. Maybe we ought to worship just a little while right now. Oh, Jesus, help us right now. Lord, you know what's going on. I pray you would strengthen this church, Lord. Strengthen these people. Let us be encouraged in the Holy Ghost and do it your way and live for you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. You know, I heard about a little boy that 
went to school and and uh, he uh, was being made fun of by the other kids. They were trying to get him to break a rule. And he wouldn't do it. And one of the little boys finally came up with something that really made sense. Yeah, I know why you don't want to break the rule. It's because you're afraid of what your daddy will do to you when you go home. And the little boy thought a minute, and he said, no. He said, really, I'm not afraid of what my daddy would do to me if I did that. I'm afraid of what it would do to my daddy if he heard that I did that. That speaks of relationship. That speaks of, of commitment. That speaks volumes. Some folks only repent when they get caught. Some folks are just here, you know, to see and be seen. Some folks are just here so they don't have to go to hell. You ought to be here to get to know who Jesus is. You ought to be here to become intimate with Jesus. Yeah. He told me one time, can I brag on Jesus a little bit? You know, if you're not careful, you can, you can think that you're just such a pipsqueak. You're just nobody, and you're just a weasel. And you, you. I had a preacher tell me one time, he said, you know, Mike, he said them early morning prayers you get into. Yeah. He said, I just want to tell you, God gave me a scripture for you. Really? Yeah. He said, Song of Solomon. Now, if there's any book in the Bible you kind of question whether it should be there or not, it's Song of Solomon. But I love Song of Solomon. Because when you read that, that's God saying to you, how much he loves you. And he even says that your voice, I love to hear your voice. Because your voice, you know, when you're praying, when he hears your voice, he says, your voice is so lovely. And your countenance is comely. If you just knew the joy that God gets out of his people when we pray, and we talk to him, and we repent, and we, oh, he loves it. I encourage you to do it. Well, Jesus did not make a mistake in Decapolis because he told the maniac of Gadara, the former maniac of Gadara, the former man that had thousands of demons in him that had been delivered, that was clothed and in his right mind, was no longer cutting himself. He said, no, I don't want you going with me. I want you. I want you to go and tell everybody what God's done in your life. So that part of the world got evangelized after all. Because he went everywhere telling people about I once was lost, but now I'm found. He must have had a powerful testimony. Don't tell me God doesn't have the last say. He has the last say in everything that happens in our lives. And we can have to walk by faith sometimes. But if you keep walking, you'll understand why what happened to you 30 years ago or yesterday. Because it all works together for our good if we're called according to his purpose. Amen. Well, we could go on and on and on about Job had to walk by faith. No, I, th I think it's time for us to worship a little bit more right now. Lord, mm, thank you, Jesus. You don't make mistakes. 
Ah, you know what the devil's going to do before he ever does it. I don't know what this church is going through. I don't know what they're fixing to go through. I'm not here to entertain. I'm here to help. I plead the blood of Jesus over this building right now. I plead the blood of Jesus over this congregation right now. I command the powers of hell and darkness to get on out the door. You can't come in here. We bind you and we cast you out and we plead the blood of Jesus over you. We claim the protection of God in this place right now. All right. The Lord just quickened to me something I want to tell you about. I don't follow notes. I try to follow the Holy Ghost. I have found that Satan or the devil is not necessarily Satan, just the demons of Phoenix, Arizona. They are very cunning. And if they can't send a demon-possessed man in here to disrupt the church service, they, we had, we've had all kinds of things happen in the last 45 years. We had this little family show up one Sunday, and they looked apart, the beautiful family. And uh, I couldn't get much out of their past. You know, he wouldn't tell me much. And, and they seemed to be, you know, you just don't want to press people too far. And we'd let them come and we let them sit. And they sit for quite a while. And uh, about a month after they started coming, there was one of my new converts came to me and said, Brother Con, it's kind of strange because they invited us to the birthday party. And uh, a bunch of us were there. And uh, they began to ask me and the people that were there, Are you able to fulfill your ministry in Brother Khan's church? Are you being used? Are, are you just, you know, I'm kind of elaborating here a little bit. And I thought, okay. You see, there's a bunch of vagabond preachers that run around that really don't have a call to preach, but they're talented. There's a big difference between talent and anointing. There's a big difference between being called of God and calling yourself. And they want to start their own little church, and you can do anything you want to do, and, and you, you will get rich in their church, that's what they tell you. Anyway, they were trying to peel off a few carnal people out of my church, and there's always some carnality in every church, and there's people that don't do what you preach, and they don't pray, and they don't really consecrate. They don't really read their Bible, but they might someday if you'll keep working with them. Well, the Lord showed me just what to do. <laughs> you got to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, you know. So, I am a firm believer in binding and loosing. He said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I found out as pastor of my church, if I think it's necessary, I can bind somebody up. I can bind them. They can't feel the presence of God. Yeah. If you get out of line, I can kind of fix it so you don't have any influence in the church. Because, you know, it's these people that look spiritual are the ones that can have influence. These people that can give tongue message interpretation, they really can look good. So I decided I'm not even going to confront them. I'm not even going to call them in the office. I'm going to let God do my dirty work for me. Oh, you're, you're, a lot, you're a lot better off letting God do it. So I got up at prayer meeting on Friday night. We have prayer every Friday night, and they were there, and I just got up and I said, now, folks, I want everybody to, you know, the Bible says we can bind things on earth, bind things in heaven, and we have the power to do that, you know. And I want it. there's a spirit that's trying to cause division in our church. And I said, 
But we're going to bind that spirit right here, right here tonight. Boy. And so we started doing what I was doing a while ago, you know, binding the devil, binding that spirit that's trying to cause division. You should have saw the look on their face. They went out the door and never came back. You said, well, we're supposed to pray for everybody. We're supposed to get everybody in here. No! Only those that my heavenly Father hath planted. Everything else needs to be rooted up is what Jesus said. I didn't say it. I didn't write it. It was Jesus. I'm just pointing it out to you. Don't get mad at me. Get mad at Jesus. There's some people that are not brought in here by the Spirit of God. There are some people that do not come because God put them there. They come on their own, and you got to know the difference. Did God bring you here? Huh? Or you just want to identify with the crowd? Or you just think Brother Crow's a good-looking guy and you want to be him to be your pastor? He is good-looking. Don't shake your head that way. Sister Crow thinks you're, huh? Well, why do you think she married you? Never mind. They never showed back up. And I was out walking at the mall having a good time, just doing my exercise, you know. And I walked through J.C. Penney just having a good time, and there they were. I said, well, hello. And they was just as, their spirit was so different. They didn't want to see me. They didn't want to talk to me. They had hatred in their spirit. And I'm telling you, folks, you want to keep the church pure and clean So that when God does send somebody, and I found out when God sends somebody, they don't sit there playing with their phone. They don't sit there looking around. But that convicting spirit that worked on them before they came through the door is going to be drawn to the singing, to the preaching. And they'll be crying before you give an altar call, probably. And they're not going to, because God knows how to bring people in the church. And if your church don't grow as fast as you want it to grow, don't worry about it. That's in God's hands. Teach Bible studies and fight people to church. Have church dinners. Do everything you can. But ladies and gentlemen, God's the one that adds to the church such as should be saved. Can you say amen? Now, I could go on and on and on and on and on and on, but I'm not. I want Sister Khan. Come on up here. Sing for us again. I want you to understand God's working on you. He's trying to cleanse you. He's trying to prepare you for a place where sin can never enter. Now, if you want to play church, that's your business. But if you want to improve your spirit, improve your life, if you want to be attractive in the sight of God, God's not really attracted to your talent, your speaking ability, your good looks, or anything else. You He don't care about how much money you got. In fact, it's the poor people many times that can be better. He don't care about what color your skin is. Your ethnicity doesn't matter to God. What matters to God is, are you pure? Are you sincere? Do you do things to make people think you're smart? What are your motives like? Oh, he's worked me over on that. I would have never seen my evil heart unless he held the mirror up. I read about Jesus in those Gospels. And he didn't look at Peter. And tell Peter, tell Peter what Jesus wanted to tell him. You know, he could have said, Now, Peter, didn't I tell you? Didn't I tell you that you would deny me three times? Are you going to listen to me now? He didn't do it. He said to Peter what Peter needed to hear. Peter, all you got to do, 
You messed up, but we're not going to talk about that. That's not what's really important. What's really important is, Peter, do you still love me? I believe there's some folks here that love Jesus right now. And Jesus said, if any man love me. Now we're not talking about just don't want to go to hell. Just We're talking about really loving God. If any man love me, my Father will come to him. We come to, we get the Father through the man Christ Jesus. That's where God's at. And God boiled it down to one human being. It's so much easier to love a human being than to love a spirit that you can't see. Focus on that man and let him reveal to you all the beautiful things about God that there is because that's what's going to happen forever and ever and ever. He said, we will come to you and we will make our abode. Amen. Let's stand to our feet, everybody.